Welcome. Uh, I'm speaking today with Patrick Dealey, 23rd winner of the Lawrence O'Shaughnessy Poetry Prize, awarded each year by the Center for Irish Studies at the University of St. Thomas here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Minnesota, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, um, so Patrick originally is from uh, Mulla outside La Cray in County Galway. Can you tell us a little bit about how you first kind of uh, discovered your your world as a poet, your voice as a poet? By, by slow and devious routes, Patrick. I had gotten away from County Galway and I had that distance which is requisite. So I went to college in Drumcondra, Dublin to become a teacher. And I missed the place. I missed the wetlands, the callows that my mother farmed. And I was solitary in the callows. I was often alone there, but never lonely. But in Dublin, I was with people, but I was lonely. So I began to write images and put them in a drawer. One night, some of my friends came in and raided the drawer because they knew I was scribbling something. And we had an impromptu poetry reading with me in bed and they were reading my poems and guffawing about them. And I said, I may as well out myself. I'm a poet, I'm trying to be. So that's how it started. Basically, to restore and to replenish what it was that kept me happy as a child. Well, very good. And so from there, did you, did you start to study Irish poets, American poets, European poets, or what was your further? Initially, I began to read Irish poets. Mm -hmm. uh, Evan Boland uh, at that time was coming to run. Seamus Heaney, of course, I even met Seamus Heaney. I had a glorious situation one night where Seamus Heaney and others, were very uh, high powered poets and intellectuals, were uh, in a pub and I was the all Saran or the beginning poet there. And suddenly Seamus turns to me and he said, Dealey, what's a poet? And I said, I saw you crossing O'Connell Bridge, which I had, with your shirt sticking out in the mizzling rain. And I said, there goes a poet. He said, that'll do, Dealey, that'll do. But I was shocked that he, he referenced me. Right, right, right. And I love that, that he was egalitarian. So I, I like the company of poets. I wouldn't say I'm great friends with them all. I'm not, I'm not enemies with anybody. I read their work. I follow all the stables of poetry, and I try and keep abreast of what's happening. So you mentioned the, one of the things about the O'Shaughnessy Award now in its 23rd year is we have this fantastic sort of uh, landscape, this contour of Irish poetic voices. You mentioned the first winner, Eva Boland, a yes. very major female voice. Yes. Can you, can, without trying to put you on the spot, but can mm -hmm. you talk about um, perhaps her importance to you or any other of the O'Shaughnessy poets perhaps? Well, Nightfeed in particular got me because she was living further up the hills than I was. I was living in Ballyboden, she was living further up in a different part, but outside in the suburbs. And she gave a voice to the experience of women as mothers and as people who worked in a domestic situation as well. And I liked that because it hadn't seemed to be there for me before in terms of uh, Irish poetry. Irish poetry seemed in some senses a male preserve. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing it seemed it seemed to be a kind of parallel to what I was doing. I was concerned with people who worked with their hands, uncelebrated people. My mother and her people, she was a farmer. Mm -hmm. She worked with their hands. She had agricultural language. She was mm -hmm. forshing August Flurshux and Gaelga. Mm -hmm. And she used that. My father had machine language. He was a carpenter and hurley maker. So between the two, I had a, I had a great feed of stuff. And But Evan was saying things that were domestic, that were uh, pertinent to the time and to the suburban experience right. and I thought that was important. Was, um, was that, so that, did that help feed into you this first collection we're going to talk about today, the Bones of Creation from 2008? The uh, Bones of Creation, I just took my own way uh, w as in the poetry. I suppose I started um, publishing initially with Raven Arts, Dermot Bulger and mm -hmm. Raven Arts and I, I, I was published alongside Sean Dunn, even then a very fine poem, poet mm -hmm. and Aidan Murphy and then John F. Dean wrote to me, I'd written something and published something and he liked it and he asked me to send him stuff, which I did. So I went with Daedalus Press. Mm -hmm. 1986 then my first book was published with mm -hmm. Daedalus. It was um, perhaps a bit early for the book, but it came out and it was about my own experiences of home and my early experiences of Dublin life. Right, yeah. right. And I had that dichotomy between the two and I've been trying to marry them since. Yeah, yeah. and uh, John F. Dean obviously was one of the, one of the very another very early O'Shaughnessy uh, yes, he winner was. here. He, yeah. he was very good to me and helpful. He gave me a start, as they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. did Dermot. Yeah, yeah. So do you want to choose something from, please, uh, from the Bones yeah. of Creation? The, well, the Bones of Creation, for me, is... Um, 
is stone. And a lot of the poems here are about stone in one manifestation or another, because stone becomes all things, dust becomes life. And this is a poem kind of catches that idea. It's almost like a story of the world. And it's set up and in and around the hills of Derry Brian and the Schlievochty Mountains in East County Galway, where I happened upon some um, ammonite stones, or I'm not sure of the terminology, but there were stones which had been used to make a stone wall, but it had actually come from that place. So it was sea life in, on the top of a mountain. Cave life. If limestone asserts the sea once stood taller than this inland hill, limestone only begins to tell the twisting tale. There is never simply nothing further. We go through squeezes down. Sunless for a million years, creatures can have no use of colour. Slowly, the long dark quenches their eyes. Skin finds ways to redefine itself and them. Bat radar is turned on. The snake's knack of tracking heat. Antennae extend, frail yet fitted to tap the convolutions of crevice and crystal. Change hazards everything, and we are not immune. Heads swelling in our acceleration of knowledge and pride render us the more prone to topple. But that here we stop, humbled under wonder wheels of calcite fruits and flowers, of beast and angel shapes, with all the time in the world at their disposal. Here we dream our first emergence from the rock, our bald skulls, smooth stalagmites, splashed by exploding water drops. Pretty good. I like that sense of the, the change and then of something that's permanent. Can you talk about the, the sense of the bardic in the, your background and in that, yeah. that point of, that particular point when you, when you uh, sort of enter the Irish kind of cultural ecosphere of yes. literature? Initially, I was a bit thrown by it because we went to school. The teachers tended to do the standard English texts and so on. And um, our language in their ears was bog English, which was perhaps derogatory. But I loved bog English because there was a lilt and a lyricism to it in terms of it was a Hiberno English. Mm -hmm. And our parents spoke it and uh, our grandparents the more so. My my grandmother, Molly Head, she was a ballad maker and she wrote uh, using the bog English and about local events, including her son, the blacksmith and stories of home. Uh, this was before the media became all pervasive. Mm -hmm. And um, I liked that language because of, as I say, it, it kind of was different. And I thought I would choose that path. Then our house was a rambling house and people used to come er court, as they still say, on a visit especially in wintertime, mm -hmm. they would come and they would tell stories. We stayed quiet. And there was one particular guy, uh, big Jim McGuire, lived to be 96. He was oh, a very large man. He was a Shanaki. He told us all the Jin Shankas and the local lore. And I loved the names of the places he named, Carashambali, Gorty Madden, Fox Hall, uh, all these names of townlands around and about Eskerboy, all these places I actually hadn't been around my own big parish. So I uh, took on his thing, but partly because of his wonderful laugh. And we as children laughed at his laugh, whereas the adults laughed at his stories. And I'll read a poem about him now Perfect. and about the end of, for me, of that particular time in Irish life. Uh, and the poem is called The Last Shanachie. His laugh comes from below the belly, below the groin, and his laugh shakes him all the way up. He slaps his thighs to help the laugh along. He tickles his sides. His laugh's a familiar animal in our rambling house, or rather several animals which he keeps contained while the story opens across familiar fields, Caro Shanvali to Esker Boy. Between the lighting of his pipe and the first spit in the fire, events take a delicious or a drastic turn. These spellbound faces, our parents young again, these lame old men redrawn to vigor, 
These holy women gone funny in se secret places. What are we to make of them? Nothing. Now his story's at an end. And we listen past the punchline for a hoarse lock turning in his throat, a rusty wheeze as of gates opening, before the pent-up beasts of merriment burst forth, neigh and bray, squeal and howl, and all our lesser beasts of laughter lift, gamble among them. This must be the resuscitation of winter earth. This the perpetual moonshine where play the dead. This, the hearth song, we will scarcely recognize as having belonged to us. After he is made to exit, blinking from the sight of the TV in the corner with his God save all here stopped on his tongue. So the, that's a real crucial threshold moment there's kind of a tearing of the fabric of the storytelling culture yes in comes the technology in comes the television yes um, the sense of Din Shanikas has been eroded or lost can you, can you talk about that moment because it's really interesting you kind of are catching that moment as it's kind of uh, as it's kind of it's almost like the Irish 19th century is fading yes as the 20th century. I, I, I think Seamus Heaney put it very well he yeah. said we, we we were medieval almost right through well into the 20th century you know mm -hmm. and into the 1960s certainly and I always felt that in fact there was a neighbor of mine Mick Dillon who was a great friend of my father my father used to visit Mick's house Mick, Mick used to come to us he Mick was a pagan but he yet believed in ghosts he didn't appren he didn't attend church priest used to say well will we see you in church on Sunday Michael no priest nor the Sunday after and uh, <laughs> yet he believed in ghosts and he wouldn't be out after nightfall but uh, Mick Dillon was one such person and he actually believed although a very learned man and traveled to Gorty Madden every morning to collect to buy all the newspapers he filled his house with newspapers he yet believed that the world was flat and he told me don't venture too far up the Lorgan Road or you'll fall off the edge of the world and out among the stars and the lost souls of the stars and I actually believed of being a child. Wow. Is there any particular Din Shanikas that you remember? From yes. That, the place lore where you... Walking Sod. Walk, okay. The course of Walking Sod. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, we almost believed it as children. Um, basically, a man came in one evening in a, great, a state of great distress, carrying his coat inside out on his arm. And my father said, what happened to you? I got the course of walking sod. I was walking in the field and I couldn't get out. I spent two hours and then I realized if I turned my coat inside out, I could find my way back. He believed it and he emerged and into our house and uh, my mother made tea for him. Another um, piece of the old lore in Pishroga was um, the Shadon She, the ghost wind. And we, would be, we used to go to my Uncle Matty's uh, farm across the village we dreaded it as children because he had the richest land in the whole of County Galway and there was so much hay to be made. You suffered with hay seeds down your throat and so on. And sometimes a little miniature hay tornado would happen and would swirl up. And basically this was Shadon She, the ghost wind. And uh, a neighbor was enthralled. They all stopped work, the men stopped working stuck their pitchforks on the ground and looked at it. And this man said, take it, take it all, take it with you, with my blessings. He was talking to the fairies. <laughs> and we as children were kind of half laughing and half unsure. Then there, was, there were physical phenomena which were, um, I suppose, um, couldn't be fully explained. There was the, um, the little ghost uh, mist, I suppose, the, um, how would you put them, St. Elmo's fires, what you might call it here, you know. Um, which uh, traveled the callows and it was a kind of light that used to move and as you advanced towards it, it retreated. And as you retreated, it advanced towards you. And my father believed in that. My mother said it was a nonsense. And uh, it used to shine on the bedroom uh, door of, uh, of my bedroom at night. And science has explained it somewhat. Right, right. As right. methane, but not fully, still not fully. Right. So I still hold to the 
possibility of wonder that I had as a child. Yeah, you, you grew up in a sort of a mysterious uh, I contour. There's nothing like a little bit of wonder to make, you, make your mind work somehow and imagine things that maybe aren't. And I suppose there are different types of wonder now, and I'm very mindful of that when I'm writing that those kind of wonders are naive and primitive wonders, but still wonder. And now the great wonders of technology and other things to try to marry the world, to be at the interface between the world as it is now and as it was. Mm -hmm. And my new book, um, The End of the World, references back. It goes back and forth through time, it goes back thousands of years, it comes up to the present, sometimes gets them both together. I don't want to go back there and stay there because if I do that, I'm a museum piece. Right. I want to only reflect that or resonate that in terms of now. Everything has to resonate, resonate with the now, otherwise I'm wasting my time. Could you read one poem from the end of the world, if you don't mind? I okay. will indeed. Um, Thank you. If I can reach across here. Um, perhaps the best one for now would be um, Vixen, because um, the fox is everywhere. Even in Minnesota, I believe, except where the, the animal that takes its place is the, uh, the, the coyote takes over, the dominant one but otherwise the fox is everywhere in Minnesota. Likewise in Galway, and even more so in Dublin. And this is the story of all the foxes I could wrap into one, uh, starting with one that's dead, but going on based on a real event, of course. And it's ultimately about how time goes. Mm -hmm. Vixen. She is the one washed across the river, daughter, for plaster to her skin, and on her face a rictus grin the one yet making her rounds, unfazed by thump or roar of motorcycle, or by ambulance's blue flickering hullabaloo, its red tinging. And she perpetuates the one leaping through a netwire henhouse window 50 years ago, the cub my neighbor fed from a trough after he had killed her mother, the cuddlesome one soon to tune in to her own feral nature, she absconds, vagabond, at home among the urban. The long rout of foxes gone before seems to become her. Those dug out, those poisoned or shot or mangled by hounds, those broken under the wheels of cars. Survivor, the glisten of health attends her, the youthful luster she won't outwear, being too wild, too crossed with the cricks and crimps of her kin. She's a fire. An aura, a lollop along the back lane, from dustbin to doorstep, a den dweller, my first Galway blazer, my townland namer. Foxall is my townland, my townland namer. And it's as if the stars have fashioned a pelt for her, the frosts a carry, the hills a cover. As darkness deepens, she comes brushed with heather smell, harebell. Stone quarry dust comes maybe to shake loose her shrieky mating of cones or the chalk of symmetry bones. This numinous one representing all, this watcher whom I suddenly want to get next to, as though she were the burning down of my years, so lightly here and gone, as I take the air in midsummer in a midnight suburb of Dublin. Can we talk about that a little bit more? Because it seems like the fox is very close to the, the trickster Irish psyche. Yes. Your reference to Galway Blazers, the, 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 the group that hunted the fox in yes. Galway. Yes, that's right. John Houston w was part of that. So can you talk about that? that this kind of seems like a very multifaceted uh, image for you, the fox. Can you kind of can you comment a little bit further? Well, I suppose it goes back again to early childhood. I was uh, one of five children. But I loved being solitary, as I said earlier. Went to the callows, found that by staying quiet in the callows, animals forgot I was there, including the Greenland or Minnesotan geese, maybe, you mm -hmm. know, in winter. Yes, yes. And they forgot, and they're pretty uh, fretful sometimes, but they forgot I was there. So I loved that. I, I saw nature up close firsthand. And of course, I imagined myself as being very much at one with it. There was, there was no filter. It was just me and other things. And you know, the way Heaney has the idea of to, to finger slime, to mm -hmm. go beneath all adult dignity. Well, of course, I fingered slime and I found things under the mud. And 
I was like Theodore Rethke, who said of himself that he was the leading under the stone poet in America. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and I was the leading under the stone boy in my own neighborhood. Oh, very good. Yeah. So it was always there. Uh, foxes were hated, I suppose. Um, foxes were ingenious. Foxes mm -hmm. found a way. Nature seemed to find a way. So even in my worst moments, when I think the world is about to collide into nothing, I still believe in the resilience of ter certain things. I think cockroaches might survive. <laughs> I think rats might survive, and maybe even foxes. And if we're lucky, human beings as well, if we, if we look after the rest, perhaps we too, right, right. we find a way. I like to think we're ingenious enough and selfless and altruistic enough to find a way to make it, to make it good for future generations of animals, no less than people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like one of the primary poetic experiences to see the fox. It is. I remember that myself. And the I was color. The color, yeah. As much as anything. Yeah, and just, just this, this sort of the grace, too. They have a certain grace. They sort yes. of have a certain mystery and grace to them. That hallucinatory thing always appealed to me. Yeah. I, I, one of my formative influences was Stan the Man Lee and yeah, uh, yeah, Steve yeah. Ditko and uh, Jack Burzma and those great people from Marvel Comics. Yeah, yeah. I, I was reading Marvel Comics back in the early 60s in full color, long before the franchise, long before the oh films yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that people like nowadays, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the language they used um, was my vocabulary because we just didn't have books in the house. We didn't have books. My family had all been craftspeople and they had made their living from the land and from the workshop and the timber business. Right. My father started with a steam engine back in the late 30s. And he powered his, his saw with a steam engine, which was highly, uh, which was cranky and clunky. And he got rid of that, bought a Ferguson tractor, and then bought a whole series of Fords and tractors, Fords and Majors, mm -hmm. and gathered tools and um, every kind of imaginable tool around the place. So they thought I should follow. We all would follow that role. And of course, I tried, but I couldn't. So I was then earmarked for a different path, leaving home education, I suppose, of a different kind. So this leads us to your, your memoir, your celebrated memoir, The Hurley Maker's Son. Yes. I wonder if you, would, if you wouldn't mind sharing a uh, sh short reading from I'd that. I'd be delighted to, Patrick. And basically, I just picked this little piece um, about my father and about my mother, how different they were from each other. As I say, her agricultural language and his uh, very precise language of um, tools and uh, craft work. And this perhaps illustrates the two of them. They got on famously together, perhaps because of their difference, or perhaps because they operated in different spheres of influence in different domains. My father, first of all. He showed me hand planes, chisels, augers, spoke shaves. I relished the names he put on them, but didn't read much else into them or try to determine what they might mean. Still, I could see how fond he was of the workshop and how something would always call him back after he had stretched for a while on the kitchen forum after dinner, with his hands making a pillow behind his head and a snooze opening and closing his nostrils. While he took short breaks from his work, my mother seemed busy always. And where his hurlies, his household furniture, his carts and wheels and farm implements would find sale throughout Ireland and in small quantities even reach as far as Britain and America. Her crafts were the stay-at-home ones of baking and cooking and sewing. But though his several engines and machines, among them tractors, sawmill, bandsaw and router, delighted and flabbergasted him in seemingly equal measure by virtue of each having a mind of its own, her solitary labor-saving device at this time was a Singer sewing machine. And of course, her sewing machine worked like greased lightning, whereas, and she never spoke to it because it was a means towards an end, whereas my father just loved the machines, not the end. Right, right. So the the um, the memoir you, again, you like the fox. You're kind of you're you're invoking this very the come on the this, the sense of the the ash made hurl. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the the craft in your father's uh, you know his his, in his business? Yeah, yeah, his mm -hmm. business. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, it's many facets. It began in the woods. We, as children, were blessed in the sense that we would get to go to the wood perhaps a week sometimes. We, a note would be written to say the children are busy helping their father at the sawmill today. This would be sent to the teacher. It, we might be in the sawmill. We might be in the wood. Woodlawn or Ballydugan or many of the woods around Galway and also in County Offaly, Tipperary and Clare and other places. And we might even spend a week there because you had to mind the timber and you had to mind the tools and getting there and getting back was slow coach work. So stay yeah. there and wa don't waste time. And we always had a bottle of Guinness at the end of the day in the wood and they had a little tent where we stayed. But he cut the trees. Those were bought from the uh, forestry department, and agriculture and forestry. Mm -hmm. uh, each tree that was to be cut had to be perfect. So it would be one out of every 12 or 15 trees would be cut, ash trees there'd be an X on it. That tree would be cut, brought home by trailer eventually, along with many others, brought to the sawmill, cut into planks. And planks were like, um, they were like volumes, they were like books. And I, 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 this occurred to me later, not so much at the time, but later when I came to Dublin and went into bookshops, I could smell the smell of books in bookshops and in libraries, the same smell as my father's workshop. Yeah. And these planks then would be brought to the, to the um, workshop and they'd, they'd, be, uh, they'd be patterned, patterns would be made of them for future use in hurleys. Then they would be ribbed at the bandsaw, then they would be planed and hand finished using spoke chef, then they would be shined or shone at the emery belt and they would be banded and branded and sold. Right. And the best hurlers from home, uh, very much a hurling area, yeah, yeah. My, my neighbours and other great hurlers and, uh, and from all over County Galway and other places would come in and they would again look at the hurley and feel it what it felt like yeah. the heft of it and say could you take a bit off here could you you know so he he always said the best hurlers are always the most demanding they want the absolutely perfect hurley did so it make did it make it to the all ireland up in crow park a few times yeah they, oh they yeah, did sadly for him he, he lost his life in an accident in his work oh he did. so um that was 78 and just two years later we broke through and won the all yeah, ireland yeah. but he yeah. missed it you know unfortunately oh, I, I kind of cried <laughs> that day you oh know, course, because yeah. we were at the match. Myself and my wife, Judy, um, yeah, was yeah. a Dublin girl, but she, she's she got into hurling through her, I suppose, connections with me. Yeah. And um, yeah, he would have loved that. But um, yeah, that, that, that became very important afterwards as a motivating influence to write the memoir because I really hadn't talked about his death. I was working in Ballyfermot as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I came back to school and I just simply um, went back teaching very quickly, didn't, didn't hang about didn't talk to even my best friends about it, and I kept it bottled up. And one, one friend said, I, I learned 10 months later that you, your dad had died. And it became a thing I didn't talk about or grieve over. Mm -hmm. And then I grieved many years later, and then I wrote the memoir mm -hmm. very quickly, having sat for maybe a, a week or two in the cold upstairs, and everything you write down when you write down for it seems foolish. And then some, suddenly something snags and clicks, and you're away, you found your voice, you have your signature mm -hmm. style. And then it wrote itself very, very quickly. And I was blessed in that Transworld took it and got published in Britain and in Ireland and got great reviews, I think. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Fair to say. Well, it's on that, on that uh, note of benediction, I'm very happy to uh, finish our, our discussion today with uh, Patrick Dealey, the 23rd uh, Lawrence O'Shaughnessy Poetry Award winner here at the University of St. Thomas. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you indeed.